hold it. Hey, I just clicked on it. And I see him up there talking. The new coach. Is he just practicing? Hey, you're. you're yep. Turn your mic off. I hear you too. Uh, I see you at the bottom of the screen. Like mine came in. Yeah. Mine came in closed. Like no audio, no video. But you see me? Oh, my camera. My camera is on. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Go to. Oh. Hey, let me get. Hey, let me get this. This is J.O. calling. Hang on just a second. J.O. My mic's supposed to be off, and my picture is supposed to be off. Yeah. I will. I will. I'll log out. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.
Yeah, but that's it, like in a small box. How can I get? I... Right. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's like, um, yeah, I mean, I can't, uh, I see B Hall on here. I see another guy, you know, and stuff. So, oh, okay. So let me, let me be quiet then. So, uh, um, Yeah, let's hope so. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm gonna take this into the other room now, so I can set up my camera to record. So, uh, you doing that? You doing that same way too? You recording on your camera? Right. Okay. Right. 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 So, okay. Thank you very much, man. Okay. Bye bye. Test one, two, check one, two. Thank you all local affiliates that have already signed on. I wanna go ahead and give you about a 12 minute warning and that's an approximate time for the beginning of this WebEx. We have the facility muted while we prepare, but we wanted to unmute since I had some calls from several of you asking about the audio. So hopefully you hear me and see me good. Please make sure to keep all of your lines muted until the moderator calls on you to answer a question. Let's go ahead and turn it back off.
Test one, two, testing audio for the second time. For the members that have signed into this WebEx, wanna thank you for joining today. This is a five minute warning, five minute warning. We're going to mute the system again for approximately three more minutes. We'll give you a two minute warning and at the two minute warning, please make sure all of your lines are muted until you're called on by the moderator in the Q&A session. Once again, thanks for joining us.
that it, uh, there was a switcher off in the back. Testing, J-O, testing. Sorry for <laughs> the confusion. Getting some thumbs up on the recording streams for the media that I see. J-O in the back. Media members, give me some thumbs up if you guys can hear. All right, I think we're good. Thanks, President Hatch. Good morning to all those on this WebEx conference and to our Wake Forest community watching on YouTube live. I'm Nathan Hatch, president of Wake Forest University. Coach Steve Forbes and athletic director John Curry and I are honored to be with you virtually as we stand safely six feet apart in the beautiful Broad Hill Auditorium of Wake Forest Business School. Before I officially welcome Coach Forbes and his family to Wake Forest, I want to share my sincere gratitude to our students, faculty, and staff who have adapted to this remote learning environment and who are in the process of finishing the spring semester strong. With finals set uh, for next week, I wish our entire student body the best of luck know you will do a fantastic job. The last few months have certainly not been easy on anyone in our country, personally and professionally, but I am grateful to the Wake Forest community and how it has continued in remote fashion to reach out and to knit together faculty and staff, students, alumni, family, and friends. As have all departments across the university, athletics, with the graceful leadership of John Curry, has done an outstanding job of adapting and putting its best foot forward during this pandemic. John has a tireless work ethic and a standard of excellence that he has and will continue to have to uphold the athletic department. I appreciate the care and thoughtfulness that has gone into this entire search process I could not be more excited to help introduce the next leader of Wake Forest basketball, Coach Steve Forbes. A few things we do connect us more than sports. Our student athletes embody the university's commitment to excellence and the pro humanitate spirit. That commitment and his understanding of what it means to educate the whole person is why Coach Forbes is the best fit for Wake Forest today. He will provide an excellent example for our student athletes on the court, in the classroom, and across our community. You're going to read and learn a lot about the great things about his outstanding on-court accomplishments, but I'm even more impressed with the person Steve and his wife, Janetta, are wonderful people, and he has a vision of how best to propel our program forward. His dynamic and motivational approach will allow him to fit seamlessly alongside our faculty and staff. During this process, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Brian Nolan, the president of East Tennessee State University, who could not say enough good things about Coach Forbes. One incident is worth noting. Dr. Nolan challenged Steve when he first arrived at the university to get to know 10 faculty members who were really part of the, the vitality of the school. And he did. Recently, when rumors surfaced about this position, six of those faculty members approached Dr. Nolan and asked if there was anything they could do to retain him there. What wonderful evidence of the difference Steve Forbes has made in the life and culture of that university. I'm grateful for the leadership and oversight of our board of trustees. Led by Gerald Roach, our trustees have been great thought partners and supporters in the university's efforts to fulfill our mission in these times. As we build a vision of how and when we can return to normal life at Wake Forest, I look forward to engaging John, Coach Forbes, and the many talents of our faculty, staff, and students. Goodwill, resolve, 
love, dedication, these are the bedrocks upon which I have confidence for the future. It is my pleasure now to turn things over to John Curry to introduce, to introduce our new men's basketball coach. John, thank you for your outstanding, thorough, inclusive, and timely and successful search process. John Curry. Thank you very much, President Hatch. I, I, I'm not going to spike this mask, uh, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with you today. This is a big moment for Wake Forest University, and I thank President Hatch and the leadership he's thown, shown throughout this pandemic. I want to thank our entire university leadership for their continued support of our athletic goals and for your wise counsel and advice. Although this is an exciting day for Wake Forest basketball, I want to first share my wishes for the continued health, safety of all watching today and to our entire Wake Forest, Winston-Salem, and broader communities. This morning, Coach Forbes participated in our weekly head coaches WebEx. He is joining an incredible group of coaches, including Kim Llewellyn, our women's golf coach, who was recognized Thursday as the National Coach of the Year. We congratulate Coach Llewellyn and her squad, which finished the season ranked number one, and also Jerry Haas, who was named today as a finalist for the Men's Golf National Coach of the Year. World-class student-athlete experience is the first of our five goals because student-athletes are indeed the core of our program and our reason for being. Following another Zoom team meeting Saturday afternoon, I then talked individually with our players by phone to get their thoughts on what they wanted in their new coach. I was so impressed by the maturity of their answers. And when I asked the question, about what they liked best about the overall Wake Forest University experience. Most didn't mention our wonderful facilities or athletics at all. They talked about community, family, our beautiful campus, and their relationships with professors and their fellow students. Indeed, Wake Forest is about community, family, and relationships. And for that reason, recognizing the overall context of this transition occurring amidst a generational crisis I felt it was more important than ever to ensure a process inclusive of the perspectives and voices from across our community, academic leaders, faculty, staff, alumni, and of course the men who have actually worn the jersey. Our search committee first met Saturday night, and I want to thank Pro Provost Rogan Kirsch, Dean of the College Michelle Gillespie, Dean of the School of Divinity and Presidential Cabinet Member Jonathan Walton, Faculty Athletic Representative Pete Brubaker, Deputy Athletic Director Lindsey Babcock and Associate Counsel Pete Puckstellis for immediately jumping in and devoting three full days to the future of our beloved men's basketball program. I also want to thank our consultant, Chad Chatlos, our Ventura Partners, a Marine who was an absolute warrior throughout this process. I also want to thank our staff, Tina Poe and many others who have worked around the clock to support this process and get us to this day. Finally, I beg the forgiveness of my wife, Mary Lawrence, who I have completely ignored over the last week. Today, I'm introducing to you a first-generation college graduate and a man who has dedicated his life to mentoring young men. Steve Forbes is a relationship-oriented leader who invests in every person around him. Consider this comment from one of Coach Forbes' players in the 1990s, now a partner in a major law firm. <laughs> Quote, what I appreciated about Coach Forbes was how he invested not only in me, but in everyone on my team, from the starting point guard to the student managers. It's one thing to inspire someone to better themselves. But true success is when you impact someone in a way that not only makes them better, but also inspires them to go out and impact others in the same manner. And that's what Coach Forbes did for so many of his players. Steve Forbes has coached and won championships at every level of college basketball. He developed NBA players, but also men who went on to be teachers and servant leaders in their communities. All 22 of his East Tennessee student, state seniors have earned their degrees. From his beginnings in Lone Tree, Iowa, Steve used education and hard work to earn everything he has achieved. He and his wife of 32 years, Janetta, three children, Elizabeth, 
Jonathan and Christopher, who have epitomized their priority on education as Elizabeth has just earned her PhD and is an academic counselor at East Tennessee State, while Jonathan is currently working on his master's degree. Janetta has taught school for 32 years, currently at Mountain View Ed uh, Elementary School. Steve expects his student athletes to push for success in the same way. Later, after the pandemic subsides, we look forward to celebrating together with that family. They've worked all these years uh, for this moment to have an opportunity like this one at Wake Forest. And unfortunately, they can't be all with us here today and with Coach Forbes. And so I do uh, send my thoughts to Janetta and Elizabeth and Jonathan and Christopher uh, and thank them for their support of Coach Forbes. I know Coach Forbes will work every moment of every day to benefit Wake Forest and to give every student athlete the opportunity to grow and excel at a high level academically, academically, athletically, and socially. And I know, and I believe our fans know, Coach Forbes will bring our men's basketball program back to a championship level. With that, I'm honored, I'm honored to introduce the head coach of the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, Steve Forbes. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Hatch, uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's a very exciting day for me and my family. It's uh, been a long road from Lone Tree, Iowa, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, before I get started, I too want to uh, make sure everybody is safe at home and through this pandemic. It's been a, uh, a very trying time and we want to make sure our student body and everybody in the community is safe. I want to extend my, our gratitude to the, all the health care workers here at Wake Forest and in the uh, Winston-Salem community and, and, and nationwide. It's, uh, hopefully we can uh, one day get back to a new, I guess, a new kind of normal. Um, before I get started, too, I want to thank my family. You know, John uh, talked about that. Behind every coach is a great family. My wife, Janetta, is at home. Uh, she's been married 32 years. Uh, she paid me back on Wednesday night taking her uh, on our honeymoon 32 years ago to Omaha, Nebraska for a, a job interview for a GA job. She thought I said wa Oahu, but I really said Omaha. And so uh, she reminded me when I went to bed on Wednesday night who was actually coaching in the ACC. And she told me that I had to coach against Coach K and Coach Williams and Jim Beheim. And I told her, well, thanks a lot. I'll get a lot of sleep tonight. So I really appreciated her doing that to me. Um, my daughter, Elizabeth, so proud of her. She's working on her PhD in global uh, sports leadership at ETSU. She works in uh, student services for academics for football. And my son, Christopher, just finished his master's degree in sports management, and he's worked for me for uh, the last six years. My son, Jonathan, is 16, and um, he's a really good student. He wants, says he wants to go to pharmacy school, but we'll see about that. Uh, I think those kind of things change as you, uh, you know, as you get a little bit older. Uh, it was a very impressive uh, search uh, as far as just the process. I've never been in a search that was as thorough uh, as this search was. And each, each day I learned more and more and more. And, you know, one of the things about a search is you're trying, you know, Wake Forest is trying to find the right fit. And as a coach, you're trying to find the right fit. And the more people I, that I talked to, the more comfortable uh, I became and the more I began to believe and then – understood that I would be a great fit at Wake Forest. And it started, you know, on Sunday night with a conversation with John and then Monday with a, I call them a Zoom meeting. I think we call it WebEx here. I'm not sure. Uh, I think they're all kind of the same. But, you know, it was really uh, an impressive group of people that John had, uh, you know, on the call. We had a provost. We had a dean. We had a dean of the Divinity School. We had some af uh, athletic people. And it was a good hour and 45 minute conversation, you know, and then on uh, Tuesday uh, morning, I woke up and had a, another one of these type of meetings, but this time with Chris Paul, Tim Duncan, Mitch Shaw, Dr. Hatch and John. And I want to thank those guys for, for really, you know, for taking part in this process. And then I reached out to, and visited with uh, the Dean of Admissions, Jane Caldwell. I spoke to her. I spoke to um, Coach Clawson. 
you know, just on and on and on. And the more and more I spoke with everybody, the more comfortable, you know, I became with the situation, the, the process of what Wake Forest is about. And then getting here uh, yesterday and just walking around this beautiful campus, seeing this uh, world-class institution, uh, top 30 education in the country. And then we went into the uh, Mid-Shaw complex and uh, for basketball. And every time we opened the door, it was like Christmas. You know, we were like, ooh, oh, wow, we got that? And so, I mean, it was a really, a really exciting time for me and, and a few of my staff members that that came along with me as we, it was my first time ever to be on campus here. And so it was, it was just extremely exhilarating and very impressive. Um, ETSU was a very special place. It was my very first division one head job. Um, I'm indebted to Dr. Brian Nolan, Dr. Richard Sanders, who hired me initially and then my AD now, Scott Carter, for giving me the opportunity to be a head division one coach. And we built uh, that program and had very, so many special memories that it, it'll remain in, in my heart forever. It was a hard, um, it was a very hard thing to say goodbye to my team yesterday. I love those guys. I love those kids. And, uh, you know, it's really impersonal when you do it on a computer. You know, you don't get a chance to hug them. And you don't get a chance to look them in the face. And so, you know, that was a, that was a difficult day. Um, one of the things that's really impressive is that Dr. Hatch still plays basketball and Dr. Nolan loves to play basketball. So I'm really, I'm going to try to get a one-on-one -on -one game between Wake and uh, ETSU, if you don't mind. You know, we could get some pay-per-view on that, I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're a better offensive player than Dr. Nolan. Dr. Nolan's a really good defensive player. He's good at closing out. Uh, but uh, I would think that would be a very, uh, we could probably raise some funds, you know, watching that. Um, John, I'm really excited to work with you, start this partnership. Um, we've known each other a long time, and John's the main reason why I'm here, um, because, of, you know, it's about trust. It's about relationship, and it's about family. And um, we built this, this, all these things together, you know, 15, over 15 years ago. And we've remained, you know, colleagues, friends, uh, professionals, and it was his vision that really drew me and attracted me to this job. Um, I want to thank Danny Manning and his staff for bringing in some outstanding young men. I had a chance to talk to every one of them on the phone last night. Um, and there's some really special young men. And I think we need to uh, applaud Danny and his staff for the hard work that they gave here during their time. Um, I told the players yesterday, and uh, when I spoke to them, I, told, I talked to them about several things. And the first thing I wanted them to know was, you know, you're never going to hear me say, I can't wait to get my team. I can't wait to get my players. These guys are my players. And I want them to know that. And I told each and every one of them that on, on the call yesterday, and I told them that last night on the phone. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to say, well, I can't wait till year two or year three. We're here to win now. And so I'm going to work very, very hard to make sure that we get all these young men back here to Wake Forest this, this coming year so we can have a very special season. Um, this is a player's program. It's not a coach's program. I've always believed that uh, college programs are about the players. You know, it's about uh, b building memories. This is our alma mater. And so I invite every former player to come back at any time and see us, to practice. My practices are always open, to the office, to a game. Come to speak to these, to these guys that we're going to have on our team. I think it's really important to have a connection between now and the past. And we have such a wonderful uh, past, and I think we all need to, to get behind each other. And so I invite all the former players, you know, to come back and be a part of this. Um, my journey is one that it's been pretty well documented. Uh, it's not something that I wouldn't trade for anything. I touched on it a little bit uh, about my wife taking her on our honeymoon. I think she kind of figured out then after I, I'd already married her, so she was she was trapped. 
and she knew that I was going to, I wanted to be a basketball coach. I grew up in a really small town with a great place to live, Lone Tree, Iowa. It's about a thousand people, but it's only 10 miles from the University of Iowa. So I had a great uh, upbringing there. We had one stop sign in our, in our town. Most people didn't stop at it, but at least it was there. Farmers didn't care for it. The guys driving the combines drove right through it. Um, I uh, started my path as a coach in, uh, in working in economic development, coaching baseball and coaching basketball. But it was the best way for me to get in. It was the only way I could get in college athletics was to wear some different hats. And I went from there uh, at Southwestern Community College in Creston, Iowa, was my first job. Uh, I went on to Barton County Community College in Great Bend, Kansas. I had a great run there, had some really great players. It's where I coached uh, Jay Heydrich, who uh, is a, a really uh, renowned lawyer there in Kansas City now. And I went on my first Division One job to Idaho, and I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I took the job at Idaho sight unseen. And I swore I'd never do that again. And there I was. Now in 2020, taking another job, sight unseen. The only thing is we had the Internet now. You know, I, I actually started coaching and recruiting before we had the internet. I know that's hard to understand. Uh, there wasn't cell phones and those type of things. But I remember going to Idaho and thinking, I'm never going to do that again. And then here I am at Wake Forest yesterday for the very first time. But this was a much better experience. Um, from there at Idaho, I went to, uh, I went to Louisiana Tech and uh, had some had really good players there. Coach Paul Millsap was in the NBA still today, or actually recruited Paul, helped recruit him, didn't coach him. Then I went to Illinois State with Porter Moser, who was a Final Four coach later on in his career at Loyola, and then on to Texas A&M with Billy Gillespie, where we really turned that program around, real, uh, won eight games our first year in the, in the Big 12, and they hadn't won a game the year before. Coach to AC Law, who was a, you know, a lottery pick, and then to Tennessee. And we had a, a, a ton of success, averaged about 26 wins a season, went to the Elite Eight, and then we got fired. And and and. I went back to Northwest Florida, and I went back to junior college, and it was probably the best thing that happened to me. We had a great run there. You know, one thing about coaching young men is you get to help them turn their dreams into reality. And that's what that's what I that's always been my mission as a coach is to help young men turn their dreams into reality. And the job of a coach, you know, is to get those young men to do the things they don't want to do in order to get the things they want in life. And that's what. Uh, we did it in Northwest Florida, and we went 62-6, and six, two national championship games, got beat twice. Kind of like Brad Stevens of uh, Butler. You know, he went to national championship back-to-back -back years, got beat, but he got the Celtics job. But I went to Wichita State, which was a great thing, and I loved it, Wichita State. The first year we went 35-1, and one, uh, coached great players, Fred Van Fleet, Ron Baker, Clee Early. Went 30-4 and four the next year, beat Indiana and Kansas in the, to go to Sweet 16, and then I got the phone call to come to East Tennessee State, which was just was magical. We just had a magical ride. We went 130 and 43. I think we were 71 and 19 in SoCon. SoCon's a really good league. And, uh, you know, got the fans ignited. Got the fans back in the building. And that's why I'm here today, too, is to, to get the people excited, ignited again about Wake basketball. Uh, you know, five years ago, I walked into a program that had had success and had some tradition, but just, you know, was a little bit tired. And it needed, it needed a spark. It needed that spark. And so I think it's really important that you understand that that's what I, I'm here to do. I'm here to, to get this program going and to get this pro program right back where it needs to be. This program uh, needs to win in basketball. This program deserves to win in basketball, and this program will win in basketball. And that's what we are here to do. Um, I think that it's really important that you understand that we plan to compete for championships, play meaningful games in March, cut down nets, and raise banners. And to get that done, we've got to reignite the energy surrounding our program. It's really important. I said this five years ago upon my arrival, and I'll say it today at Wake. Buy your tickets now. Okay, buy them now. And make the Joel a home court advantage. Let's once again get the entire country excited about Wake basketball. I know we've been through some tough times. But don't, you don't want to be that person that 
doesn't have a ticket, that the next day when we have an exciting win at home and you have to ask about it, don't be the one to ask about it. Be the one there taking place at the game and enjoying the atmosphere. Um, from 1970 to 1983, I attended Lone Tree Community High School, community schools. Actually, I went to one school, K through 12. Uh, it was one building. The elementary was on the bottom, high school on top. And, uh, but our school colors were black and gold. So I've come full circle. I believe this, if you cut my veins, I bleed black and gold. I believe that. So with that being said, I want to say go Deeks. Once again, I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity, and I am really excited to get this thing going. Thank you. All right, everybody, if you want to, so coach, you can stay at the podium there. Um, we'll uh, open it up for questions again. Comment in the chat box if you have a question. Uh, Coach Forbes will answer some questions, and John Curry is also available. With that, we'll start with Connor O'Neill if you want to take yourself off mute. Yeah. Hey, Steve. I'm Connor. Uh, we talked yesterday. Um, curious, we, we talked yesterday about roster management and roster building, and it, it looks like there's already an update that we need with uh, Ishmael Masood, Odi Aguama, and Olivier Saar this morning reportedly uh, entering the portal. So can you – What's your what's your feelings on that? The, all those guys. Do you expect the remaining players to enter the portal? Um, and and what what are the chances that you get some of these guys back or all of these guys back? Well, you know, I, we talked to every player uh, last night. I had unbelievable visit with Olivier, uh, Ishmael, all those kids that we're talking about. I think it's one of those things that you know there's uncertainty at this time, and they don't know me, and uh, we have to build a relationship, but. But I've told them over and over again that my number one recruiting responsibility and priority is to, to get everyone back. Um, none of those guys, not one player that I talked to last night said they did not want to return to Wake. They, they all have the desire to return. It's just a matter of relationship. And I understand that. Uh, and I told them that. You know, and, and I can understand if you want to, you know, look at your options. But you're not going to look at a better option than Wake. Okay, you got – you got the you got the triple double right here, right? You got the you know one of the top thirty educations in the country. You got world class facilities, and you play in the best league in America. So you know you can look. They'll look around, and uh, but they'll find out that this this you know a lot of times the grass isn't greener. And uh, you know it's my job. It's my job to build relationships. I will tell you this: um, it's a little bit difficult because of the pandemic. I don't get to put my hands on them every day, literally. Um, I don't get to touch them. I don't get to love on them. They don't get to see my face, my passion. Maybe they don't want to see my face. But, you know, it's, it's a challenge. But it's a challenge that I'm up for, and I'm going to work really hard to build this relationship, and I really want to get, you know, everybody back. Just a reminder, please say your name and affiliation when you're asking a question. With that, we'll go to Josh Graham. Welcome, Coach Josh Graham, Sports Hub Triad Radio. Um, in the last 10 years, Wake Forest has been to one NCAA tournament. But before that, 1990 to 2009, I think only three ACC programs had won more games than Wake in the league. What do you believe the standard for Wake Forest basketball should be? Well, it's what I said, what I said earlier. I, I think we need, we need to be competing for championships. Um, and that would be in the preseason and then in the regular season. And we want to compete for the championship in the postseason, and we want to play meaningful games in March. And what does that mean? That means getting the NCAA tournament and winning games. And then hopefully at some point we get a cut down in that. There's nothing more uh, exhilarating as a player as getting the opportunity to climb that ladder and cut down in that. Now, that might be in the preseason. That might be during the regular season. It might be, you know, in the postseason. I'll, I'll use this as an example. You know, as, as disappointing as it was not to be able to play in the NCAA tournament with my team this year, we did get a cut down a net for the regular season SOCON championship the week before in front of our fans, sold out in Freedom Hall. There would be nothing better than to do that in the Joe, right, in the Joel, right, to cut down your, the net in front of our fans, you know, on, the, on a regular season championship. And then we went to Asheville and won the championship, SOCON championship, and we climbed the ladder again. Cut them down in Asheville. It'd be a great thing to do that 
wherever the tournament's at, you know, it could be Greensboro or wherever we're having it. But those are those are the things that, that I expect, and I think those are the things our fans expect, and I think those are the things that they deserve. And so, again, we've got we to light the fire. And it's going to take everybody. It's not going to just be us. It's going to be us, the players, it's the community, uh, you know, the, the, the students, our faculty, you know, everybody involved, administration, we got to get on the same page and get this train rolling down the tracks. Aaron Beard, you want to take yourself off mute? Go ahead. Hey, Steve, Aaron Beard with the Associated Press over in Raleigh. Um, I realize coaches typically you tailor your approach with roster management and, you know, transfers and recruiting and those types of things to the school you're at. So I'm curious, how much do you anticipate you have to tweak or your, your approach now at Wake Forest compared to what you were doing at East Tennessee State? Well, I believe there's five tiers to recruiting. Uh, I've always believed that. And I, we, those five tiers of recruiting are what we used at ETSU. The first tier is high school and prep school. And I believe that you got to go inside out on that. And one of the greatest advantages here, unlike where I was at before, is we have an unbelievable amount of players and talent in the Carolinas. And so we got to work inside out. And I think that's the very first thing that our staff has to, our approach has to be is to keep the Carolina kids at home. And so we'll work really hard at that. I think the second level is uh, junior college, but that's not going to be available here, you know, at Wake Forest. And so that's not something that we will be exploring. Third option is transfers, like you said, and maybe someday there'll be one-time transfers. Who knows? You know, I think those things are all up in the air. But I do believe that, you know, transfers uh, are definitely a viable thing. And I'll give you an example. We have 13 scholarships. It's really hard to play 13 guys. So every year that I was at East Tennessee State, I registered one or two guys. And it really helped their, their development academically, helped them with their body, help them with their basketball. And so that's something that I think we will explore as we move forward is transfers. You know, then I think there's grad transfers. And I think we've already signed one. And, you know, you have to look at that market and see where they fit. But they got, it's got to be a fit. You know, it's got to be a fit for basketball. It's got to be a fit academically. And so we got to do our due diligence there. And then I think the fifth uh, tier is uh, international. And we've done well there. And, I, and that's something that, you know, I've been, I've recruited international in the past. And it's something that we'll definitely get involved in. So the, the five tiers are, you know, high school, prep school, junior college, um, transfers, grad transfers, and international. And at Wake Forest, it'll be four tiers. Lauren Walsh, take yourself off mute and go ahead. Hi, Steve. Lauren Walsh from WXII 12 News in Winston-Salem. Welcome to the area. I was reading an article where you said for a future head coaching job, it would need to be a school where in-state talent is strong. So you just touched on that, obviously being in the state of North Carolina. I'm wondering how you plan to handle in-state recruiting, especially going up against those schools in the triangle. First of all, um, I'm never afraid to recruit against anybody, okay? Um, we're not going back down to anybody in recruiting. We have too much going on here, too much to sell. And uh, so we're going to get after the very, very best players, you know, in, in the Carolinas. And I have two assistant coaches on my staff, you know, Brooke Savage, BJ Mackey. They both are Carolina, or they're both from South Carolina. They've done a really good job of recruiting that area. My, one of my very best players at uh, East Tennessee State right now is Davian Williamson. And he's from Winston-Salem, played at Winston-Salem Prep. So, we're very familiar uh, with uh, with the, with this area, and we're gonna we're gonna get to work. We're gonna get to work today, you know, offer some kids and, and get after it. And so, um, you're right. I didn't have that advantage, and um, you know, I've been in a couple places in my life when I coached at Idaho. If you would have dropped an atomic bomb on Moscow, Idaho, you never you wouldn't have hit a Division One player. Okay, um, you could probably maybe done the same thing where I was at. You know, there's a few, but so it's really an advantage. It's nice to be able to get in the car and recruit. And uh, we'll be able to do that. And, and again, we got to get people on campus, man. We got to get, you know, people in the state excited about coming in here and, and seeing all the great things that we have to offer. We got we to keep them, keep kids coming and, and looking. You know, 
know, and then and then and start recruiting them at a younger age and and get them excited about the Demon Deacons. And so I'm really looking forward to to that to what you just talked about is having uh, those really good in-state players. Les Johns, take yourself off mute. Go ahead. Hey, good morning, uh, Steve. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, you mentioned yesterday and then today about uh, having conversations with Dave Clawson uh, prior to accepting the job. And it got me curious, back in 2008, you were on the Uni University of Tennessee campus along with John Curry and Dave Clawson. Um, what kind of relationship did you have with those, those two guys back then? And was, do you have any good stories about the three of you uh, together at the same time for anything? I'll tell you this right now. I talked to more. I talked more to Dave Clawson this week than I ever did when I worked with him. Okay, um, you know, at Tennessee, it's a little spread out. Everybody's at different facilities, and um, Dave was was there for a short time, and, and um, so I didn't really, honestly, didn't know Dave. Uh, I don't think I ever met him. You know, and so it was really refreshing to visit with him, and I visited with him three times. I think he has a really good pulse for this institution, um, academically and athletically. I think he's a very wise, on top of being a great coach, I think he's a really wise man. And so I leaned on, you know, listening to him an awful lot. You know, when I, I met John right when I, this interesting story, Coach Pearl I said I had the job, he hired me, and I, I, I lived up to what I had said. I said, I'm not going to take the job unless I come see it. So I flew in and I'm thinking, you know, I got the job, I'm ready to go. And then he said, well, go meet with John Curry. And, and John was, um, at that time, was a associate AD and uh, what's the word, our, our basketball AD, basically. And he said, so he, John starts interviewing me. And I'm like, don't I already have the job? And, uh, I mean, he's grilling me. I'm like, whoa, whoa. And so I knew right then John meant business. And so uh, – I always respected working, you know, at Tennessee because I always knew he had our best interest, and that was really important. And uh, so I don't really have. I'm sorry, I don't have a three of us together because I don't think the three of. I think at that point we were we were social distancing. We just didn't know it, and um, we didn't really get in the same area. Kevin Connolly, go ahead. Kevin Connolly with Fox Eight WGHP here in the Triad. Uh, you mentioned the uh, call or video conference that you had with Chris Paul and Tim Duncan. I I I'm curious as what was their input and what was sort of their message to you taking over the program? I thought I was going to put Tim to sleep. I wasn't quite sure. I was a little worried I wasn't doing a good job. But come to find out, he was paying very close attention to what I was saying. And Chris did too. Honest truth is they didn't really say a whole lot. They were there to listen and to learn. And I'm, I'm awfully sure that afterwards they had a lot of input. And, you know, it's the first time I really had met those guys, and they were, they were great. Um, they asked me afterwards to provide some names of players that I was currently had coached in the NBA. I gave them Fred Van Fleet, uh, Landry Shamit, Tobias Harris, um, Jordan McRae. Ron Baker had been in and out. And I'm pretty sure those guys reached out to those players uh, that I had at coached or recruited to talk about, you know, me and what kind of coach I was. But um, as far as interaction, it was it was really um, Mitt, Dr. Hatch, and John. And I think John was pretty uh, – I think he was a little bit late, more pretty laid back for John in that, in that conversation. It was more – Mitt was – he was pretty uh, – he asked a lot of questions. He was awesome. And then Dr. Hatch asked a lot of great questions. And so um, they kind of carried the conversation, and those guys did you know, a lot of listening. Casey, go ahead. Coach, this is Casey Getz from uh, WCYB up in Bristol. Uh, congratulations. Just want to know if you could talk a little more about, you know, you talked about a special opportunity you would take to leave ETSU. You know, why you believe Wake Forest is that? And also, if you could touch on what your message was to the players from ETSU when you got a chance to talk to them yesterday. Casey, you're trying to make me cry again? Man, come on, man. Don't make me talk about the players. Um, you know, uh, 
you know, the message to the players is very simple. You know, the, the love um, that we have for each other, um, you know, just the great memories, um, all the hard work, the togetherness that we had. And it wasn't just the guys, you know, from that team that we just had 30 and 4, Casey. It was everybody. You've been around. You know the, you know the camaraderie that we have. You know what it's like when we have basketball camp in the summer and the whole team's fighting to come back to work camp and hang out. And you know, that's what we want to do here. And so yeah, I guess, you know, really it's just that bond. I really didn't try to stay on there too long. I knew it was going to be really hard, I, and, I, and it was and it was too impersonal. I wanted to be able to see him face to face, um, but you know we did the best we could, and and um, and I and I moved on. And Dr. Nolan and Scott Carter and Coach Shea, who I hope gets the job, uh, visited with the players. You know, Casey, I've I told you all along it have it would have to take a very special place, a very special opportunity for me to leave, and I found it. You know, I wasn't looking for it. Um, there, and as you know, there's been a lot of opportunities before, um, and most of the time I just said no before I even visited. But I just couldn't turn away this time, and there's just so many things. And again, I go back to the, the three things that really are important to me, you know, and that's first the, the education. You're just not going to beat a Wake Forest education. And I'm really excited to go out and, and, and sell that and, and have that in my hip pocket when we go recruit. Uh, the facilities, uh, I mean, the facilities are phenomenal uh, all over this. Not just the basketball, but the entire campus. I haven't had, I haven't taken a campus tour yet. I plan on it, but um, but just driving around, it's just it's just beautiful. And then, you know, the ACC, being a head coach in the ACC, um, did I lay in bed at night and dream about that? It's not where I'm from. You know, I grew up in Iowa. I probably would have said maybe Big Ten, but. But to get the opportunity to coach in the, in the, in the most historical, most prestigious basketball league in, in the United States, I, I just couldn't. Those things all just added up, and there was just no way for me not, not to do it once um, I was given the opportunity. Connor O'Neill, go ahead. Yes, yeah, Steve, um, backtracking a little bit in your, in your career, um, I'm curious if – if the way that things ended at Tennessee, if you saw that you'd be a head coach in a in a Power Six conference someday, uh, and what it's like been like to to get to this point, and maybe what you've been able to learn and apply from from your time at Tennessee, and and how that all went down. I mean, to answer your question, no. I mean, when on March twenty second, which was my birthday. I think 10 years ago, 2010, I was cleaning out my office with my son, and I never would have thought that, you know, I would be a head Division One coach. I, I thought there'd be a chance, again, to coach in Division One. I. I didn't know when, um, but I didn't really think at that point. I think kind of felt like that probably was not going to happen. And But listen, you know, you, you, you learn, you hold yourself accountable, and then you get back to doing your job. And I had the, the, the wonderful opportunity – to go to, to Northwest Florida. And, and I've, I've said it before, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I could have stayed there, to be honest with you. I could stay there and been very, very happy. But, you know, this whole thing is relationships too. And, you know, Chris Jans uh, is one of my best friends and he's the head coach of New Mexico State now, but he, they had an opening at Wichita State. They're just coming off the of Final Four. Greg Marshall didn't have to hire me. You know, but he did, he did. And I'm very thankful that, to him for giving me that opportunity. And then, you know, it's like, um, you know, you go pick a horse, right? And you got some bunch of horses out here, and then you got Secretariat sitting over here. Well, you pick Secretariat and you blow everybody away. And that's kind of what happened when I went to Wichita State. I, you know, they, go, they went to the Final Four, and they got this great team coming back. I come in, in there in July, and my job was just not to say anything. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. And we went 35-1. and one. You know, and, and then in the following year, we go 30 and four. And, you know, uh, Chris leaves. Uh, he goes to Bowling Green. I'm, you know, I kind of move up. Now I can coach a little bit and say something and, and have an impact. And then, you know, you're doing your deal and, and you're winning and we're going to the Sweet 16 and then East Tennessee State comes open. I don't even know that it's open because, you know, I'm in the Midwest and call and they offer me this wonderful opportunity so if you really think about it 
you know, four years after I got fired in Tennessee, I'm a head division one coach back in the state where I got fired, 90 miles from where I got fired, uh, working for with an athletic director that was there, Scott Carter. So I guess it comes down to, you know, how, how tough are you? What's your, what's your will? What's your drive? How you treat people? You know, I try to treat people w with respect. I treat people the way I want to be treated. And I think those things come back, you know, in many ways when, in a positive way when you do that. And so, yeah, it's, it's a heck of, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, but one that, that I'm very proud of and, and um, wouldn't trade. Jeff Mills, go ahead. Jeff, you're on mute. Hey, Steve, sorry about that. It's Jeff Mills with the Greensboro News and Record. Um, you touched on attendance at ETSU earlier. Um, that's been an issue here at Wake. What did you do beyond wins and losses to um, help things get better at ETSU? Well, first thing is win. You said it. It's, it's a great way to fill your building is to win and play a style of play that people like and play uh, tough. And I didn't really touch on that earlier. You know, the, I think the identity of our team, Jeff, and you've seen us play, you know, the number one thing is we play hard, we play smart, and we play together. And this is how we're going to play. This is how we're going to play at Wake. Okay, we're going to play hard, smart, and together. Now, we may not always play smart, but we're going to play hard and together. Okay, we're going to share the ball. We're gonna, and I told the players this last night. We're going to move the basketball. Everybody's going to touch it. You know, um, we're going to be gritty, grimy, and tough and together on defense. You know, that's the only one original thought I've ever had was that, was that, was that slogan. We put it on our rings twice, but being tough defensively, you know, and diving on the floor for loose balls and playing really hard, sharing the ball, grabbing the ball with two hands, and then doing what we're supposed to do when we're supposed to do it, executing. So to, 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 to say what, to answer your question, Jeff, if you didn't know anything about basketball and you came to watch us play, you'd say, man, when you left, you say, man, those Wake Forest, woo, wow, they play hard. They play like their hair's on fire. I mean, the coach don't have any hair, but they play hard. And they really share the ball. They must like each other. You know, they're really tough on defense. Man, they grab the ball with two hands. They rebound it, and they execute. And so I think, you know, you got to have identity before you can have culture. Identity is immediate. And that was the thing that when I came in the door from day one was that. And then I got out in the community. Uh, not only me, but the players. And I think this, I think, you know, you can't be standoffish. You know, you got to be somebody that people feel like they know you and they can come and be approachable and talk to you. And so I spent a lot of time speaking, uh, being on, going on, on campus, going to faculty, faculty senate, student government, speaking in the cafeteria, um, you know, just on and on and on. And then as you start to develop these relationships on campus, in the community, now you got good kids, people like them, and now you start winning. Now everybody kind of wants to get on the wagon, you know, and let's go. And that's kind of what happened in Tennessee. It was always, or East Tennessee, it was always there. It just, it just needed somebody to get it going again. And that's what we did. And that's the plan here. That's the plan, is to, is to have this identity, have these great players and great kids, and get out in the community, myself, on campus, and spread the word. And, and if anybody wants to help with that, I'd take it. Josh Christensen, go ahead. Uh, yes, Coach, uh, Josh Christensen with uh, KRG in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, you touched on it uh, a little bit um, with your your coaching career, just your, your path. I guess what just kept you going, knowing that, you know, eventually you would get that, you know, quote unquote, big break in that, you know, being able to coach at a big school and a big conference with all the jobs that you've taken throughout your career. That's because I love, I love basketball and started, um, you know, in the fourth grade when my dad brought home a hoop for my birthday and I just started playing out on the driveway and I just fell in love with it, you know, and, and, and growing up in Iowa city, close to Iowa city, being in Lone Tree, going to watch Lute Olson. You know, um, 
post practice and watch the Hawkeyes practice and go to those games in the field house and you couldn't even see you're sitting behind a pillar. You had restricted viewing seats. And, you, and I grew up doing that. And, you know, I just love the game. I love coaching it. I love the kids. You know, and, and my wife and my family and my staff invest, you know, in those kids. And so when you're down and, and, and you're not, you know, when you're saying like, you know, you don't know if it's going to happen, you just got to keep plugging. And I think the best way to, to get a job is do a great job with the one that you have. And I've always taken pride in that, doing a great job with the job that I have. I've never been one to look ahead or looking for another job. Those always just came because I did a great job doing the one I had. And so um, you know, I think all those things, you know, uh, inside of you, how you, were, how you, you know, the enthusiasm that I have for what I do kept, keeps you going. And, you know, I was lucky, too. I worked with some great coaches. Greg Marshall was a, you know, a national coach of the year. Um, you know, Billy Gillespie was a Big 12 coach of the year. Coach Pro was an uh, SEC coach of the year. I was telling Dr. Hatch, you know, the other, the other day, yesterday when we were visiting, you know, I got a, you know, a bachelor, a bachelor in coaching from, you know, Coach Gillespie. I got a master's from Pearl and a doctorate from, you know, Coach Marshall. So I was very, I'm very, very fortunate to be around outstanding coaches and learning what to do and what not to do, and then adapting those things to me. Eddie Hughes, go ahead. Coach uh, Eddie Hughes from Spectrum News here. Uh, just curious, you mentioned how you went about the community, went out and talked to the community right now with the pandemic. Obviously, that's going to be hard, but trying to get the fans excited, you, you definitely have a message here. Will we see more social media posts like your hype video that you and uh, John Curry sent out yesterday, or how will you go about that, trying to keep that momentum going? I mean, how would you not want to see a face like this? I mean, come on, man. Yeah, I think social media is really important. Um, I was tweeting last night at 3 a.m. You know, I think it's uh, something to connect with the fans, connect with the students. I had students, I actually had students uh, from Wake Forest direct messages me last night, tell me how excited they were to come to the games. And I invited them to come to my office to give me advice on how to get them to the games. So I think those kind of things are very healthy. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great question. I think in the pandemic, we're going to have to really be um, mindful of social media and use it, you know, the best we can and uh, get those kind of things out until we can finally get out there and see each other and be around each other. And, and that's that's important. That's important to me. Um, and so I think. You know, we used, when I was at East Tennessee State, we used Zoom. You know, I didn't even know what Zoom was. When I was a kid, Zoom was a PBS uh, show that, you know, it was like Sesame Street. So I, I, I didn't really even know what Zoom was till pandemic hit. And so uh, I'm really, I'm getting educated, you know, through this whole thing. But yeah, I, I, I and I would, I would get, okay, get, let me know. Text me, call me, tweet at me, let me know what you think would be a great thing to do to get out in the community. and. You know, I, I don't I use I don't say no. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't say no unless it just interferes with practice. You know, um, I, I'll, I'll I'll be there if, if I can. Lauren Walsh, go ahead. Hi, Coach Lauren Walsh from WXII again. How would you describe your style of play that you hope to implement on the court, just beyond the hustle element you described? I, I mean, again, I think everything we do builds to our identity, you know, but I do think you have to coach to the players that you have. And so style of play can change from year to year. And this is something I was talking to the players about last night on the phone. And I'll give you an example. You know, uh, one of my best friends in the business is Nick Nurse, the head coach of Toronto Raptors. And, you know, this summer we were spending a lot of time together and, and he convinced me that we should run five out motion positionless basketball. And he, and he read what he ran with the, uh, with the with the Raptors. So I started to study it and look at it. And I'd never really had coach motion before. I'd been in some programs where we ran it, but not like that. I studied the Nuggets, I studied the Bucks, my, all of our staff did, and we ran it this year. And I think it's one of the reasons why we were 30 and four. We had great players. Listen, great players make great coaches, okay? Bottom line. But, the, but schematically, I thought it was, it opened up the court. It gave us a chance drive the ball, 
to, to get to the basket, to drive and kick. It gave our big guys the opportunity to shoot threes, to drive the ball, dribble handoffs and roll, a lot of things. And so I can see us really evolving offensively as a team that's going to play positionless basketball on, on, the, on the five spots on the floor. That doesn't mean we won't throw in the post. That doesn't mean you can't go in there and post up. You just don't stay in there. A lot of times what happens when you have offense where the post player just stands in there the whole time, it really clogs the lane up. And I think the game is evolving to where we want to open it up to court and play. Defensively, I, you'll see me play pressure. You'll see me play pressure. I, I'll, I'll, zone will be the last, last option. That doesn't mean that it won't have to be used, but we'll do what we have to do to win. But I will, I will start out by teaching aggressive man-to-man -man and pressing to get the tempo, you know, going in our direction. And, and you know, I think you got to turn defense into offense. I think that was one of the problems, you know, we've had here the last couple of years. Not enough defense to offense. You know, we got to we got to create havoc. So um, I don't I don't want to use the word havoc. Somebody else uses that word. We want to create pressure, you know. So um, I think you'll see an aggressive style of play, you know, um, not sitting back on our heels, but taking the fight to the other team. Ethan Joyce, go ahead. Hey, Steve, Ethan Joyce with the Winston-Salem Journal here. Um, you mentioned the guys in the portal and how they hadn't ruled out returning to Wake Forest. Um, I just want to know, how does that affect kind of your procedure going forward as far as the effort you put in of, of trying to get those guys back, but also the effort you put into maybe starting to reach out to transfers and, and figuring out how this roster comes together? Well, you, you, you got to do both. You got to do both. But I, I really believe that we have, I'm going to spend my time with our current players. And, and I'm, I will make some calls maybe once in a while to some new players, but – Coach Forbes is going to concentrate on the current roster until we have a decision. Those are our most important recruits. Again, the grass isn't always greener, you know, it's, and not just for the players, but for the coaches. You know, these are fine young men. They uh, are ingrained in our community. They love it here. They love the league. It's my job to, to build a relationship with them to get them to come back. And so that's what I'm going to do. They're going to have to tell me no. And, and honestly, I'm, in a, I'm a, relation, a relationship recruiter. I didn't play in the – I mean, you can, I might have played in the NFL before I played in the NBA. Um, but I'm a relationship guy. And uh, I want it to be hard for Olivier and the players and Ishmael and Isaac and all those guys to say, I can't say no to coach, man. Golly, I want to play for him. You know, that's my job. And then that's what I'm going to work on. It, it's, 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 it's a tough time because I really would like to be able to have them right here in front of me, you know, but it's, that's just not the case. And so, um, but yes, we'll continue, we'll have to continue to recruit, you know, and build the roster in other ways. But my main focus will be the current players. Uh, Les Johns, go ahead. Yes, Steve. I think I read um, somewhere like yesterday that you are potentially sleeping. That you and the, the new staff are going to stay at the Shaw Basketball Center. Uh, is that true, or is that where you uh, you spent the night? That's the, my bathroom is bigger than my office at ETSU. I mean, like, come on. I got a living room. I got an office. I don't need to leave. Okay, I got a shower. Um, man, I, I could. I could stay there, you know, and there's going to probably be a lot of times my wife will probably tell me to stay there. But, um, yes, we were there late. And, uh, you know, but, hey, listen, that's – that's we're not any different than anybody else. You know, I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, we're going to outwork people. We're going to work. And we love what we do. But, yeah, we were there late. And um, I was thinking about getting a blanket and just, hang, you know, just kind of laying down and getting back up. And I probably will do that a little bit. But what an unbelievable – office complex. I got lost three times in the office complex last night. I couldn't find my office. Um, had to, I was kind of walking around in circles. Uh, Frank Davis, my director of basketball operations guy, was so happy that he had a door, that he was so fired up that he had a door. I mean, I think it's great that we are that excited about our facilities. I mean, they're awesome. And so, but we can go out and sell that and, 
And when kids come on here, they should feel that way. It shouldn't be like, oh, next. You know, it, it, it is incredible what we have. And, uh, and, the, and we're, you know, we feel that way. And so, um, yeah, we had a little takeout and uh, hung out, and we'll, we'll do it again tonight. Uh, Christian, go ahead. Hey, Coach. Christian Jackson with the old gold and black, the student paper. Um, so you won 24 games your first year at East Tennessee State and found instant success in each of your other two uh, head coaching jobs. How confident are you that that instant success will come at week? And if not, uh, how confident are you that you will be able to overcome more of a challenge? Well, that's always going to be the plan every year is to, uh, you know, to win, you know, double, get double digit wins in the non-conference, you know, compete for the conference championship and then compete for the, the ACC uh, tournament championship, play meaningful games in March. And when you add all those things up, they'll add up to 22, 23, 24 wins or whatever it is. Now, those are goals, um, not so much, you know, number of wins. And when you start winning those things, then those, you know, they start to add up to that amount of wins, and we were able to do that. And so um, that I told the players that yesterday. I'm not here to waiting on year three. I'm not here waiting on year two. We're here to win now. We're here to win now. And, and they have to feel that way, too. And I was telling them that. you got to have a swag about yourself. you got to be confident. And my players play confident because we give them confidence. And, um, but I was talking about that last night with the players. Like, you got to believe that. You got to believe in yourself. You got to believe that you can win that many games. And, 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 again, it's my job to instill that confidence in them. But I want them to feel that way when they come here. Now, does that happen? I, I don't know. You know, we'll see. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll figure out why and we'll fix it. And we'll get better. And that's what coaches do, and that's what teams do. But that's the that's that's the expectation. Why would I be here? Chris Lee, we'll go with you. Hey, I think I'm in. Um, Chris, this is Chris Lee from WRL in Raleigh. Sorry, I think my computer just froze a little bit. Uh, Coach, you mentioned um, inviting former players back. Randolph Childress, of course, is a former player, and he also is on the last two coaching staffs. Is it going to be important for you to have him uh, come back in some form on your staff to help sell Wake Forest as, uh, you know, its culture to potential recruits uh, for the future? Well, first of all, Randolph is a, is a legacy player. He'll always have a place here at, at Wake Forest. I called him yesterday. I spoke to him, you know, on the phone, and I want to. I want to visit. I'm going to try to visit with him, you know, uh, tonight or in the morning. It, yesterday just got going away too fast, and I didn't have time. And so after I'm done here, I'm going to reach out to him. But I am going to sit down and visit with him, talk to him about it. You know, what opportunities are going to be here for him. But he's always going to be a part of Wake um, in some capacity. I don't know uh, if it'll be a part of my staff. I think it's just something. It's not just my decision, it's his decision too. It's kind of like when I was trying to find a fit, you know, he's got to find a fit too. And I, we need to get to know each other, but I've heard nothing but great things about him. And so I'm really looking forward, you know, tonight or tomorrow to sit down and visit with him about his future and our future. Uh, any final questions for Coach Forbes before we wrap up, guys? All right. Well, thank you, Coach Forbes. And, uh, and we appreciate everyone in the media for being on this call today. Thanks, Dr. Hatch. And thank you, John Curry. And, uh, go Deeks. Appreciate you. Yes. Well.